So we have like 37 merchants. I follow up with this. So that's like that. Yeah, you just said it's good. That's the other thing. I have a lot. So that was a good thing. And it got me through what I was doing. I'm the designated cop. Just rotate around.
Do you want them to have the time that you can share? The time, you said? Yes. 7.36. Thank you. What was the name in the stage of its developmental process. It's all moving forward to something else. Uh, so please recognize it as a moment in the life of this piece, not as a piece that is done. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Once again, I'd like to introduce Dave White, the Artistic Director of WordPress, to talk a little bit about the plays you're about to hear read. Uh, and a reminder, when this is all done, you're going to pass by some lovely people with hats. Uh, while we offer everything we offer free to you, nothing is free to us. So if you'd like to drop something in the hat on your way by, please do. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening and welcome. Um, this year's Gumbo has a little bit of a theme that we've been working with. One of the things that, that became of great interest to Generous Company in the past year was some of the, the connections that are being made between neurobiology and uh, as a company, we began thinking about this in a group of, in a group of us and thought, what's well, nice and fun to talk about this in a small group of people, but what if we got a big group of people involved in this? So uh, as our district director of WordBridge, I thought, what better group of people to approach about this than all of the playwrights we've worked with over the years? Since 1994, WordBridge has worked with over 70 playwrights developing 86 plays. So we sent emails out to all of these playwrights and said, hey, we're kind of thinking about neurobiology and theater. Would you be interested in thinking? about neurobiology and theater. We heard back from 18 of our playwrights, and they agreed in one month to look at a prompt based on neurobiology. Uh, sometimes it was a chapter from a book. Uh, Charlie Rose did a brain series, so it may be an episode from that. And we asked them to write new plays based on something about neurobiology that inspired them. So what we have this evening are readings of three new plays that were written in the past 60 days. Uh, by three WordBridge playwrights. Our first piece that we're going to see this evening is Big Box Beauty Queen by Will Fancher. We also have Sight Unseen by Kevin McPhillan and Perception Play by Deborah Yarchin. So we're really thrilled to get to have these new plays this evening. Over the course of the whole festival, we've been reading and presenting 19 new plays that are connecting neurobiology and theater. So it's a really exciting conversation. We're thrilled to have you here as part of it. Once those three plays have been read this evening, we have Deborah Yarchin will be Skyping in with us for a brief conversation from Iowa, where she is finishing her graduate degree at the Iowa Playwrights Workshop. So stick around if you have any questions. She'll be happy to answer any questions you have, and I think she may even have some questions for you. So we'll see how all of that works. So without further ado, I'm happy to pass you off to the very capable hands of the WordBridge Reading Company and Mr. Bob Harris. So thank you very much. Our first 
playwright of the evening, Will Fanter, is a playwright located in Chicago, Illinois. He attended Wordbridge Playwrights Laboratory in 2009. Big Box Beauty Queen, a play by Will Fanter. Characters, Malcolm, Ben, and Betty. Seven, a city apartment. Time tonight. At Ross, a city apartment, small and cluttered. The front door, in addition to the knob and deadbolt, has four more locks to fix to it. A large sheet of butcher paper sticks to one of the walls. On it is written, new job, and underneath that, the following. Mike, white, funny hair, gold chain, hair shaped. Kayla, black, tall, nice ass. Kathleen, earrings, tits. Gray, Armenian. Sam, there's nothing next to Sam's name. On another wall is a blown up snapshot hanging upside down of a middle aged woman. Above it is written, This is your mother. Malcolm paces and speaks on the Hello, uh, Stan? Stan, yeah, hi. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, I'm real excited to start tomorrow. Excited to start getting paid. Yeah. Yeah, so do you mind if I ask you a favor? Uh, it might sound a little weird, but uh, I promise I'll, I'll explain it tomorrow. It's a lot easier to, to get into it in person, so... Okay, uh, do you know what you're going to be wearing tomorrow? Or maybe you got an idea of... Uh-huh. Uh-huh, okay. Okay, nice. Um, good. Also, and I'm sorry, and, and I promise we'll get straight into it tomorrow. Is there, um, is there anybody else working there named Stan? Or anybody that kind of looks like you there? Like, same hair color, body type, age? Okay, good. Good, good. Okay, great. I can't wait to start. Sorry, um, <laughs> one more thing. Uh, you're probably going to think I'm crazy or something. I'm really not. When I see you tomorrow, just in case I, like, don't act like I know who you are, could you say uh, picnic elephants? <laughs> yeah, just say that to me. <laughs> like elephants on a picnic. Yeah. <laughs> but don't say elephants on a picnic. Say it like I said it the first time. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. Uh, again. <laughs> I will not mention again. Okay, bye. <laughs> he hangs up, waits for a moment, he picks up the phone again, dials again. As he waits for the other end to pick up, we hear a phone ring from behind the door. Betty? Open the door. What did you what did you say? Open the door. Please, just what do you say? Now we open this fucking door. Goes to the door and goes to the people. He unlocks and opens the door. Betty stands there. She carries a suitcase in one hand and a lockbox in the other. How long were you standing there? I don't know. Let me in. Where the hell were you yesterday? At my sister's. Your sister's? I can call her a bear upon that? Fuck you. Let me in. What do you say? Please, just say it. Jesus Christ, you can hear my voice, you see my hair, and you know what I look like. God damn it. Just say it. Get the fuck out of my way. Pushes past it. He grabs her and tries to push back, and she breaks out his hole. Keep your hands off of me. Don't ever touch me, okay? Big box beauty queen. Big box beauty queen. Big box beauty queen. Are you satisfied now? I'm sorry. Why didn't you come home last night? Or why were you at your sister's? You have to ask. I was worried. <laughs> what do you think? The government got me? Don't laugh about that. You know not to laugh about that. That shit happens. I'm done. I'm done with it all. I'm sorry. No, I'm not, I'm not sorry. I'm done. I just came to get the stuff I had over here. <coughs> I can't anymore. I can't. The job's for a week and then gone. The nights. The only thing worse than the nights are the days. No, the websites and the theories, the petitions to the president. Jesus, you wouldn't even recognize the president if he came and stand right in front of you. He's black. Yeah, so is everybody. None of that's my fault, you know that. Some of it is. <coughs> enough of it for me to know that you're not trying hard enough to make this better. I'm sorry. I can't be strong enough and supportive in all that shit. I gave you a goddamn shot, okay? That's more than I should have ever been asked for. 
Wow, look at you. All self-righteous. Yeah. Now let's all feel bad about you. <laughs> Try living your life from inside someone else's head. Well, that's all I fucking do. No. Nope. I won't get roped into this again. I'm getting my stuff from the bedroom. Just don't get in my way. He walks to the bedroom. He reaches around her from behind, gently this time, and holds her close. Don't. He kisses her neck. We're too good. Don't leave. Don't leave. We're too good. We're too good. We're not. Please don't. We're not good anymore. I can't help it. You know that. Yes, you can. Some things you can. We're no good. We're so good. did this to me in the first place. No, they didn't. You don't know! Yes, I do. It's a hospital. I trust a hospital over a dozen crackpots on white power message boards. It's a government hospital. There's an agenda. There's always an agenda. You can't afford it anywhere else. It's them or nothing. And if you want me to stay, then it can't be nothing. What's your second? This. He points to the lockbox. <coughs> I'm sleeping with you. The gun goes in here. Okay. Only I have a key. I won't have you freaking out on me in the middle of the night again. Is that what this is all about? Yes. All this, all this is about you putting a gun to my head in the middle of the night. This wasn't my fault. Yes, it was. Having your gun under your bed is entirely your fault. Entirely your fucking fault that I won't have it. I won't put my life in that kind of danger. Why are you asking me to do this? Because I love you. More than you ever know. No. Why are you asking? Because Betty would never ask me to do this. What? Betty knows what danger we're in. She understands that tyranny begins when they strip us of our arms. She would never ask me to do this. Who the fuck are you? Please don't. No, I said, who the fuck are you? Grabs her and throws her to the ground. Pulls a pistol from under his shirt and points it at her. Big box, baby, big box, big box. Shut up, shut up. What do you know about it? You think you've ever been scared of anything in your life? They erased me. You get that? I can see everything, but I can't recognize it. It's worse than if they'd taken my goddamn eyes out. I didn't do anything. It was a bullet. It's what they done. It's what they done. Plenty of my buddies took a bullet somewhere or else, and not one of them had this happen. They picked me, they picked me to stop me, and they made it so I can't see what's right in front of me. My whole life is waiting for this goddamn trap to spring. You want to take my fucking gun from me? Not ever. Who the fuck are you, and why did you pick me? Betty. Bullshit! You're not Betty, what have you done with her? I'll put a bullet in your goddamn head and see how you like it. Drops his hand, slumps to the floor next to Betty, bursts into tears. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. He gathers himself up and stands, goes to the lockbox, and puts the pistol inside. You, you got it? I do. Lock it. Cautiously, she stands up. Eyes locked on each other. She locks the lock. I need to call my work. Tell them I can't come in tomorrow. You want to go off show? Your face got a little messy. I can tell that much. He passes to the bathroom. He dials his phone. Hi, Stan. This is Malcolm. I'm supposed to start. Yeah, that's right. Elephant Pigman. 
Yeah, so I'm sorry, but I can't come in tomorrow. Yeah, it just came up. It's it's real important, like a doctor's appointment. I mean, it is a doctor's appointment at a hospital. As he talks, Betty walks in front and walks in from the bathroom. She's dressed the same and has the same hair and body type as Betty, but we can see clearly that this is a different actress. He stares at her. We can see recognition fighting with confusion. She sees it too. Big Buck's beauty queen. Yeah, I'm still here. End of play. Our next playwright of the evening, Kevin McMillan, is a playwright and teacher based in Columbia, Missouri. He has previously been a two-time regional finalist in the Kennedy Center's American College Theater Festival, one-act competition, a national semi-finalist for the John Cowboy Sort of Play Award, and a finalist for the Heimann Award. Sight Unseen, a 10 minute play by Kevin Cook. Paris, <coughs> Henry, mid 50s, owner of a family magic shop. Hank, 12, a customer. Time, present day. Setting, Henry's store, Henry's house of magic. Lights up. Henry enters from the back room carrying several sealed cardboard boxes. He places them on the shop's counter. The shop is full of empty display cases, boxes labeled trash for sale. He picks up a clipboard and checks off several items, places a stack of unloaded magic trick set sets in a box, checks off several more. After a moment, Hank enters from the shop store. A small bell in the door opens. Sorry, we're closed. Oh, there was no sign on the door. <laughs> Sorry, we're still closed. But that's okay, I wasn't going to buy anything anyway. Hank doesn't really <laughs> He looks around the shop with his display cases and several open boxes. Can I help you with something? No, I'm fine, thanks. I'm just looking. Well, if you wouldn't mind looking somewhere else, we're closed. The door was open. Yes, I can see that, but that doesn't mean the shop is open. We're out of business. But you've still got so much stuff. Exactly. What are you selling? Not enough. I mean, what was it you were selling? <laughs> magic. Henry's house of magic. Magic like tricks and stuff? Like tricks and stuff, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, can you show me one? Look, kid, I have a lot of merchandise to sort out. I need to catalog everything that's going back to the warehouse, being sold to other stores. It's just one, please. No. no wonder this place is going out of business. <laughs> <laughs> this place is going out of business because of kids like you. Kids who come in and say, hey, show me something, show me something, and never buy, okay? I'm not here for your amusement, now get out. And Henry begins ushering me now. Wait, 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 look, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Look, what if I buy something? Oh, like you've got any money. Time to go. No, really, I'll buy something. Just show me one trick, okay? Henry walks back to the counter and disappears behind the display case for a moment. When he emerges, he is holding a long silk scarf. One trick. Henry presents the scarf. He pulls the scarf out to its full length. He makes a fist with one hand and slowly pushes the scarf into the closed fist with the other. He shakes the fist slightly, blows on it, and when he uncurls his fingers, the scarf is gone. See? There's your one. It's in your thumb. Excuse me? <laughs> the scarf is in your fake thumb. And he grabs Henry's hand and moves the plastic thumb over his real one and pulling out the scarf. <laughs> nice catch. Well, that was your trick. Now, what did you want to buy? That doesn't count. What? <laughs> Come on, that doesn't count. That was lame. I figured it out. Was Whether or not you buy a good trick wasn't a condition. You said, show me one trick, you would buy something. If you're not going to buy something, then you can get out and let me get back to work. Look, there's no way that counts. It wasn't even magic. And what exactly do you think magic is? 
is. I don't know. Stuff appears, stuff disappears. Yeah, and how exactly do you think that happens? Magic? <laughs> no, you said it's Henry's house of magic, not Henry's house of fake thumbs. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll let you in on a little secret since I'm going out of business anyway. You want to know the secret? Sure, I guess. Magic isn't real. See? It's all perception, deception. It's about, it's all about getting the audience to look the other way while you're doing something else. You're watching one hand, right? When you should be watching the other. You're watching the scarf, you should be watching the fist. I wasn't watching the scarf. Yeah, yeah, well, most people do. <laughs> Don't you have, like, one good trick? One really good one? I saw this trick once. It was the first really real trick I ever saw, actually. Only way I'll show you this trick, though, is if you buy it. I can't see it first. No, that's not the deal. I show you this trick you bought, and then you leave, okay? Okay, deal. Henry looks around, finally finding the correct movie box. He opens it, removing a small, Carved wooden box, which he places on the counter in front of him. When I was about your age, my older brother took me to the fair. He just wanted to smoke behind the grandstands and try to pick up girls, but my mom wouldn't let him go without taking me. Right off the main strip, past the corn dog vendor and the broke down pinball machines, there was this little stall. Nothing more than a canvas tent with a Two tables, really. And a sign, Jeffers Magic Emporium. All Jeffers. You gave him a quarter, he'd show you a trick. Over and over again, I'd beg my mom to make my brother take me to the fair, and that whole week, all my quarters went into Jeffers' pocket. The last day, when I went to find him, old Jeffers was gone. I ran all over the place before I caught up, up with him, packing his stall away in the back of some rusted out old pickup. I begged him. Begged him, begged him to teach me, take me with him. I, got, I could learn magic from him, It'll be a student. He said he couldn't. I'd have to learn on my own. He'd give me something, something that his teacher gave him, the source of all his powers, this old wooden box. But, he said, it could never be opened or else all the magic would run out and be gone for good. It had to remain sight unseen if you wanted the magic to last. All I had to do, all I had to give him in exchange was all the money I had. And I gave it to him. Every cent I had left. And? And what? And, and what's in the box? How should I know? I never opened it. You never opened it? If I'd opened it, all the magic would have spilled out and be lost forever. Why, why would I open it? How is that a magic trick? It's the greatest magic trick of all. He sold me a trick that can't be solved. You open the box, all the magic is gone. You leave the box closed, all the magic stays in there, safe and sound. It's even dumber than the first trick. Hey, you can't. <laughs> That's real magic. The box is full of magic only so long as this lid stays closed. Magic is about how you see things, not how things are. Maybe I could open the box and prove that it's in there and then let it be gone. Poof. Disappears forever. And I'm stuck with some empty old box. But anyway, that's not my problem anymore. It's yours now. You bought it. This? Yeah, this. Are you going to go back out of the deal? It's not even a magic trick. You just tricked me. Well, you asked for the best trick I had. All I did was show it to you. Now, fork over the cash. Thank you. The last ever sale at Henry's House of Magic. I just hoped I'd really see something. Something for you. Here. 
I'm not taking this. Look, forget what I said, okay? Magic is real. I can prove it. One more trick, okay? Henry rubs his fingers together, slowly producing a coin. Real magic always costs a little something. Henry slaps the hand with the coin down the counter. When he moves his hand, back his hand, the deck of cards has appeared. Henry hands Hank the deck for inspection. Real enough so far? Henry takes back the deck, removes the cards from the box, and taps on the counter's glass top. He places the decks deck on the counter and slowly begins rubbing the cards across the glass. One by one, the cards slowly pass through the glass and are seen dropping down into the counter's empty display case below. How did you do that one? That one? That was magic. But I mean, how did you do it? Seeing isn't believing. It's the other way around. Don't forget your box on the way out. Henry moves behind the counter and resumes checking items off his table. Hank picks up the wooden box and begins to exit. He stops and returns to the counter, which posits what little money he has. Hank exits. The light slowly fades as the ringing of the door's bell fades out. Blackout and play. player of the evening, Deborah Arkin, is in her final year of her MFA at Iowa, where she is an Iowa art star. Her plays have been produced at the Philadelphia Fringe Festival, Theater Masters, and Off-Broadway at the Young Playwrights Festival. Her awards include the Kennedy Center's Gene Kennedy Smith Award and the Richard Melvin Playwright Award. Perception Play, an experiment by Deborah Arkin. Time, July 17, 2011. Place, the Mattress Factory, Pittsburgh. Characters, Brooke, 24, female. The figure in the dark. In darkness, Brooke speaks. I'm in a room. It's dark. It's black. The room darkens even more. Uh, I have no sense of my space. It can be as small as a walk-in closet, or as vast as a vast dungeon or an art history lecture. I'm at the mattress factory. The projection unit steps. The light from the slide illuminates the space. Brooke sits in a chair. She's 24. She wears denim capris and a shirt. A long purse slash black satchel sits next to her. I'm alone. I, I assume I'm alone. And, and then I hear breathing. The Mattress Factory is an uh, art installation museum in Pittsburgh. Installations like... I'm on a road trip. Stopping at every art museum in search of... perspective. Recent breakup. Our third one. The first time it was him, the last two times me. I keep going back, which is why I'm here. I'm hoping in all this art an answer will appear. Also, it, it helps me run other people. The Mattress Factory is museum number 32. But well before I hit the dark room, I noticed something odd. Besides the receptionist and woman at the cafe, there are no other people. No doses, no security guards. Like, there were more people at MOBA, <laughs> Museum of Bad Art in Dedham, Massachusetts. <laughs> One riding the station. <laughs> Here, uh, as I wander through the space, it's just me. Just me and Mandy's. <laughs> I take a lot of photos. The mattress factory has all kinds of spaces that lead you to self-reflection. I call this one perception play. Am I standing or? 
or lie on the floor. <laughs> Bad reception is all that stops me from sending it to Dan, my ex. The image is the perfect prelude to James Thorell, the crafter of my next experiences. Thorell is the master of playing with his audience's perceptions. See? This cube floating in space, if you step closer, it's revealed to be just light projected on the wall. Terrell is like this, this cowboy of electroluminescence. His medium? Light and darkness. Because the next exhibit I enter is pitch black. It's called Pleiades. The pamphlet outside the door warns, Pleiades is a dark piece where the realm of night vision touches the realm of eyes closed vision, where the seeing that comes from out there merges with the seeing that comes from in here, where the seeing develops over and through dark adaptation but continues beyond it. You enter a dark tunnel, maybe six meters long, into a room. No, not so much a room uh, as a space. A space where you have no sense of space. You sit in a chair, and you stare into total darkness. You're supposed to sit for 15 minutes until your eyes adjust, and then you see it. it whatever you're supposed to see. Bam! It, it forms on a wall like this galaxy, Pleiades, or some kind of light appears. And I think this is it. This is where it all comes clear. I enter the darkness. Uh, there's a chair. And I enter railing and silence. I'm the only patron at the museum. About two minutes pass. <coughs> Sound of breathing. <coughs> breathing. Faint. Barely perceptible. To the right of me. Hello? Uh, I'm thinking maybe it's part of the exhibit, right? But I know Terrell focuses on light. Faint, but unmistakable. By this point, my eyes have adjusted. Not enough to see the thing I, I came to see in front of me. Uh, that's still ten minutes away. But in the corner, to the right, I do see. I think I see. I'm pretty sure I see. Darkness around the form that appears to be a man. The new light turns on, revealing five or six feet away from her is Peter in the dark, cloaked in all black. He sits on a chair. The breathing grows louder. The figure in the dark reaches into his cloak with its gloved hands. It pulls out a sign and holds it to the audience. Open the note taped beneath your chair. At this time, please open the note taped between you, beneath your chair. Go. I realize I can shed light on this stranger. I, I go for my phone. I realize my eyes will never adjust in nine minutes. I won't see. Oh, fuck it! You're trying to turn away. Oh, but no game. The pictures I took earlier drained the last of my battery. Damn, my perception play. Am I standing a lot on the floor? 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 Am I I am almost certain this is not what Terrell intended. The figure stands. The girl, Brooke, any more gumption, stands. She moves towards the center of the space. So does the figure. They stand close, several inches apart, perhaps. They don't touch. They breathe in the same rhythm. It's almost easy. Suddenly, inexplicably, in this moment, nearly every date or boyfriend I've ever had or dreamed of flashes my mind. The no pants, the white first date that seemed such a good 
idea at the time. <laughs> the guy I dated before I realized Axe is the scent of run. <laughs> this guy, we, I shit you not a thing for llamas. <laughs> <laughs> slides, the figure move, moves closer to her. There's these things I read about. Animal echo chambers. A chamber made to block all sound. They use it to test things like the sound displays on cell phones. And, and if you sit in an animal chamber, with the absence of noise, you hear yourself. You become sound. You tune into the sound of your blood and your veins. I'm hardly in an animatic chamber, but in the darkness I start to hear the sounds of our hearts beating. The sound of a heart beating, or perhaps two in sync. The rushing in my ears. By now, I know. Whatever it is, it's close. So close, it must feel the vibrations of my heart, the sound of my blood freezing the moment I told you this, hope this could ever end well. And I know I should run, but a, a six-meter hallway is all that's between me and the exit, and that even if these eyes have Already adjusted, I can probably bolt. Instead, I know there's probably only four minutes left I wait. Somewhere in Arizona, in the Beaver Desert, Terrell is in a crater, two miles wide. As I sit in his dark exhibit, he's building a massive installation that uses natural light. I wonder if he's alone. I stand in the line of the floor. I stand in the line of the floor. I wait because I know there's something missing. That thing that's just at the edge of your vision. That thing that maybe, maybe you stay. Or form. Blame Terrell. Blame MC Escher and his impossible shapes. Panini and his, and his paintings of paintings. And all the artists that ever made me fall in love with art. Almost 15 minutes in, something starts to slowly form on the wall. My eyes are finally adjusted. The light steadily increases through the following. Humans were on a raised platform. On the floor below, there's a gum wrapper. In front of me on the wall, there's a, a big gray shape. Not a galaxy, not the 
answers to my life. Just a blur of gray. And I decide. Light snaps right enough for all of us to see full space. The figure is no longer behind her. The seat next to her is empty. The space behind her open. She is alone. different 